G'day, I'm Ian Smith and I'm about three quarters of the way through fairing the whole surface of my 24 foot Ranger class hole. Fairing, or scrubbing down as it used to be called, is the process of getting rid of the bumps and hollows on a whole surface so that it's smooth and fair. Now it can't be just power sanded, that would get it smooth, but there's a difference between fair and smooth. And it might not show up until you put the final gloss coats on. If you've got it smooth but not fair, you'll end up with a bunch of ripples in the reflection. If you've got it fair and smooth, the picture will be distorted, the reflections will be a bit distorted, but they'll be evenly distorted. The first thing is to make sure that when you set the hull up, that you've set it up fair. You've set the moulds up so that the planking will follow a fair curve. That's, if you don't do that, you're in trouble from the first. About 40 years ago, a friend and I were engaged to fair a 45-foot fiberglass hull that was amateur built. It had been built in a shed where it was close up to one side. And when we, when we checked with battens the fairness of, of one side before doing the final surface fairing, we found that it was reasonably okay. We went around to the other side that had been against a wall and I'm not kidding, it was up to about an inch and a half, 40 mil or so out. And there's no way in the world we could have put bog, enough bog on that to fair it, so we did the best we can, but the boat was always awful. So you've got to get that part right in the first instance. The difference in fairing a carvel planked hull like this, as opposed to a fiberglass hull or a sheathed timber hull, is that when you do that kind of work, you can do, do it with bog, adding filler, sanding it off. Anytime you've got a low spot, you can fill it with more bog and then sand it back in fair. On a carvel planked hull, you're stuck with the lows. If you've got a low, you've got to plane the area around it down to it. You simply can't add bog. You can add filler in various dings, divots, and, and various things like that in small amounts. But if you try to fair a large area with bog, on a timber planked hull, it will inevitably crack and probably even fall off at some stage in the future. So it's all got to happen in the wood. Most of the work of fairing a carvel planked hull can be done with hand planes. I like to use a number three for most purposes on a boat of this size. It's light enough to be handled easily, especially when you're working overhead, uh, but it's still got enough heft to it to cut through. I use this on more than half the surface area because this is a very shapely hull with a lot of curves. So all of the convex areas and all of the flattish areas, I was able to use a number three. On a trawler or a bigger boat, you may choose to use a number five, something with a longer base. Now for the hollow areas, like the reverse curve under the bilge of this boat, I've used round soled planes. Now you could use a round soled adjustable compass plane like this. I find these a little bit heavy for, for my purposes. So I've used wood sole compass planes. Now this is a an old junk shop find that I managed to just alter the curve slightly. It was already curved. Um, and I find this gets in quite well to some areas of the curve. When there's a tighter curve, I've got a tighter radius one. And these are used diagonally and, and across the grain, although you've got to be careful not to break off bits of the plank edges. When it gets really hollow, I've got a shop made one which is hollow in both dimensions. Hollow across this, that way and hollow that way and with a round, rounded blade. And I find that this gets into any hollow on this boat that, I can, uh, that I've come across. When doing lots of diagonal strokes, you've got to be careful not to lose the fore and aft fairness. So I use a, a round soled plane. This is an old marples plane that I've rounded the base and slightly rounded the, the blade. 
and you use this along the plank, parallel with the plank, to knock off any high spots that the, that the diagonal planing has left. Particularly tight spots for and after, I've occasionally used a scrub plane with a well-rounded blade. I used that chalk as a shadow coat, but it doesn't show up as well on uh, on film. So I'll do it the other way that I sometimes do it. And let's just colour it in loosely with a pencil. Just hatch the surface with a pencil. Any areas that you know are going to be particularly low, you might give an extra bit of pencil to it. The work is simplest on boats that are long relative to their beam and with narrow planks. The planks are fitted all thickness to the same dimension, just slightly over the designed finished dimension, so you're really just planing off the high spots along the seams. On boats with a lot of curve in section, a lot of the planks will need to be prepared from thicker stock to allow for hollowing and rounding, and I've found it easier to hollow the plank until it fits, then roughly round the outside before fastening it on, planing the edges down to the designed finished thickness. This way, you'll be removing more wood in the centre of each plank than at the edges while fairing. You may be tempted to use a power plane, but I'd generally advise against it. But it could help on some holes. I confess I did use a very fine set power plane in a couple of places on this hole. Having said that, I noted in my book that the biggest advantage of a power plane is that it removes a lot of stock in one go. The biggest disadvantage of a power plane is that it removes a lot of stock in one go, so be cautious. If your seams are the high spots, plane along the seams making a series of flats like in spar making. If the seams are the low spots, like on this boat, start with diagonal strokes. The blade tends to find the high spots. Come back on the other diagonal, though be aware of the grain direction in the plank, it can determine the direction in which you plane. It can become tricky when adjacent planks have their grain running in different directions. Less planing and more sanding is usually the way in this area. Don't stay in one area too long, keep moving and overlap the areas you're working on. Don't forget to keep those blades sharp. Check regularly with flexible battens for bumps and hollows across a lot of different angles as well as fore and aft. Mark any high spots and plane them down. It helps to be looking towards a light source. Be particularly careful to make it symmetrical at the bow unless you want to sail better on one tack than the other. When you're happy with the plane surface, it's time to fit the plugs and any gravos or graving pieces necessary and trim them off as I showed in the previous episode 12, gravos and plugs. But to remove the plane marks and the plugs, you'll need to go to sanding boards. These are flexible boards that can either be shop made like this or commercial. I think these are still available from uh, 3M. And you need a variety of these because of the different, to use in the different areas of the whole surface, like this one is quite curved and flexible and conforms to the fairly curved, more curved areas of the hull. I have a smaller one from thinner plywood that, that will, for a shop made, you can have any sort of handles you want and they conform to, to more, flex, more curved areas. Flatter areas, you'll need a larger, flatter one. And whatever you use, you use a, a, very, a very thick, a very coarse grit, animal grit like 60 or 40 grit. Now, these are often called torture boards, partly because they're tortured and twisted to fit the whole surface, but also because they're bloody hard work. When I was in the 40s, I could outlast my apprentices because of just sheer experience. Now I'm uh, finding that I need to take slightly longer breaks. 
My wife said to me, you're not going to die and leave me with an unfinished project in the shed, are you? And I said, well, of course I am. Let's just hope it's not this one. As with the planing, it helps to have a shadow coat to monitor progress. I generally mark the hull with pencil hatching. On the really curved areas of the hull, you need to use your more flexible boards. If you use too stiff a board, they'll tend to dig in on the corners. Diagonal strokes are the main way to go. You go one way, then you go back the other way. After diagonal sanding with flexible boards, finish off with four and a half sanding with a stiffer board, but still move it around and vary the angle of your strokes. Make sure all of the plugs and gravos are not remaining proud. Torture boards aren't a great deal of help once you get to the hollow areas. I have a foam block shaped to a shallow curve that I use in these areas, just holding the sandpaper in place and using diagonal strokes from different angles and directions and like always, moving it around and overlapping the area of work on. In really tight hollows, I hold the sandpaper on a rigid cardboard tube, and again, keep it moving around. You may be tempted to use a foam pad on a disc sander, which does have its place. At the Sydney Wooden Boat School, we used it a lot to remove glue dags on strip planked hulls and for basic fairing. In fact, on strip planked hulls that are to be sheathed, it's pointless to fair the planking surface to the nth degree because it has to be fared again anyway after glassing. In this shot of me and the owner using grinders on a 45 foot hull in the 1980s, we're actually grinding the glass overlaps, not the fairing compound. You would need to be very brave, skilled and cautious to fare with a foam pad. Most boats this size are best fared with long two-man boards. You still need to regularly check with flexible battens. You're looking for a smooth, even curve with no bumps, hollows or sudden changes of direction. Hold the batten at lots of different angles. This is a good chance to catch your breath. Mark any areas that need attention. I've done a little bit of work in this area with the boards and you can see that the shadow coat is showing me, or the hatching is showing me, that I'm still a little bit low there and a bit there and a little bit along here. There's a bit of a flat spot in the middle of that plank. Well, that tells me that there's a bit more to remove around there. I, I can't fill those areas. I can only cut down to them by working on the area around it. When you're happy with the surface, you can prime the hull. I'm using a different primer above and below the waterline, so I marked the waterline with a laser level at this stage. There's older ways we used to use before lasers, but geez, why would you bother? The laser makes it so easy. I'm only doing a single coat of primer at this stage to prevent oxidation of the wood surface. This is a rare exception to the rule of painting from the top down. It's safer here to paint from the bottom up to keep it out of your hair. Now there's more fairing to do on the top sides after the seams have been corked and paid. I'll be then adding a couple of coats of primer and then several coats of the high build undercoat. Then I'll sand that with long boards with 80 to 120 grit paper. Now you can get too particular about fairing even at that stage. In the old days, boats were often launched with just a couple of coats on the top sides and then refared a few months later when the wood had had time to take up. 
and was in the condition that it was going to be for most of its working life. Now, when launching this boat, I'm going to have a few fairly particular people in the crowd, so I want it to look pretty schmick when it goes in. But I'm sure that a few months later or up to a year later, I'll pull it out and refair the top sides again. But getting it to this stage is a bit of a milestone and worth celebrating. Mm -hmm.